The Artha Shastra is a classical Indian Sanskrit work which deals with the issues of statecraft, economics and war. The text has traditionally been ascribed to the figure of Kautilya, a royal advisor to the Chandragupta, the first of the Maurya emperors. However, it appears from textual analysis that the work went through a series of composition and reductions uh, by numerous authors between the 2nd century BCE and the 3rd century CE. The text is both dialectic and prescriptive in its contents. Often, it will list a very detailed descriptions of the roles, costs and actions a ruler should take in very specific circumstances. However, in other areas, it lapses into a dialogue between several advisors, including Cotillia, where they debate the merits of different courses of action when facing difficulties of government. There has been some debate by scholars as to what the nature of this text actually is. For some thinkers, the book is similar to Machiavelli's The Prince an amoral text discussing the realities of power and the means by which to attain it. More recent scholarship, particularly for those trying to seat the text in a narrative of quote-unquote Eastern statecraft, see the text as offering a guide on how a state can survive in the turbulent realities of the world but still provide a good life and benefit to its people. The key component to the state in the Arthur Shastra is the monarch. There is no debate of republicanism or democracy. In the case of the Arthur Shastra, it is very much that a he, the idea of male kingship, is unchallenged. Everything centres around the sustainment of the king's power and the prevention of usurpation and the decline of the dynasty. This centres firstly around the king's own self-control, with recommendations to avoid vice and practice a diligent regimen of constant work and self-improvement. However, once the ruler is equipped for self-control, he then surrounds himself with capable and loyal advisers and obedient princes who can be groomed for eventual succession. The text goes into such detail, including the temperament, training, salaries and selection criteria of such persons, as well as the management and protection of the royal harem. However, it is not on goodwill and merit alone by which the king should manage his personal affairs. Having secured his person, cabinet and home, the king then employs a robust, pervasive and self-scrutinising network of spies which check the quality, potential, disloyalty and performance of his ministers, princes and citizenry. The Arthur Shastra clearly recognises the importance of information and understanding to government, but also portrays a slightly paranoid ideal where the king is constantly on the lookout for those who would overthrow, betray or undermine his position. Perhaps a somewhat realistic position, noting the violence and the political upheaval following the collapse of the Mauryan Empire. This duplicity goes as far as using body doubles to keep the king safe from potential harm. However, it is far from limited from the need to protect against internal enemies, with a constant focus throughout the text on the need to keep an eye on those beyond the borders who covet one's own power and position. The text also goes into significant detail with regards to the day-to-day -day running of the state. This includes discussions on tariffs, taxation, standardisation of weights and measures, but in particular, there is a focus on the law. Unlike the law of Manu, the Arthur Shastra is more focused on the nuts and bolts of family, criminal and civil law, rather than the issues of spiritual and religious legislation. This includes issues of marriage, inheritance and property, but also deals with the issues of punishment. The law recommended by the Arthur Shastra is harsh by today's standards, including death penalties, mutilation, and also including issues such as witchcraft and sexual crimes, including punishments for homosexuality, which is not in line with modern Western ideals, but also for bestiality. The text also recommends numerous emergency management plans in the case of drought, famine, and other disasters, including demonic incursions. Besides the law, the Arthur Shastra then commends the ruler to advance his interest and the interest of the state through the economy. If he desires gold, pursue land and population. These are things which bring gold and should be preferred to the yellow metal itself. Similarly, the king should enrich the state so that it becomes attractive, drawing the populations of those around him into his fold. Not only will this increase his economy, but simultaneously decrease the economy of potential competitors. The text even includes a detailed description of the appraisal of gems and treasure, so that the king can spot forgeries and understand the true wealth of the kingdom's treasury. It is probably from this large portion of the text dedicated to laws and economy from which recent authors have derived an understanding that the text is about good governance rather than the raw pursuit of power. 
However, I would argue that the text references to avoiding that which will bring outrage in more, is more in line with the protection of the king and the elimination of corruption, which undermines the royal prerogative, rather than any focus on directly benefiting the people. The Arthur Shastra is constantly aware of the threat of factions from within and the enemy from without, and the pursuit of good laws and economy appears to be more focused on combating these twin terrors rather than any nebulous societal good. The text then turns to the issue of dealing with those external enemies, other states which covert the king's territory. It deals not only with the issues of raising and maintaining an army, but also with the reasons behind going to war and making peace. In the Arthashastra, states are viewed as potential enemies and allies on the basis of their location. Those immediately adjacent will want to expand their boundaries at the king's expense, and as such are natural enemies. States who don't share a common frontier, but who share a common intervening state, are natural allies, as they will both compete with the kingdom in between them. The book describes these relationships as circles. And by this logic, there is an ever-expanding circle of increasingly distant friends and foes. One can and should manipulate common interests and alliances to overcome the designs of one's foes. Even peace is seen as a weapon by which to fix an enemy in a disadvantageous position without committing further forces or effort, constantly seeking advantage, but also being aware of the realities of smaller and larger states. The book also recognises discretion as the better part of valour. Why risk everything when a short-term treaty and a loss of some treasure will secure your own position? However, the text is also aware of the dangers of upsetting the balance of such circles. If a king was to gain too much power, then they may bring an alliance down upon them. If they are too harsh with another kingdom that they conquer, they may excite fear in their allies and betrayal. As such, the king is expected to tread carefully to maintain his position. The text was very influential in classical and medieval India, however it was lost from the 12th to the 20th century CE. Eventually rediscovered in 1905, in the modern era it has become a controversial text between those who see it promoting everything from brutal realism to socialism and land reform. Regardless, the text has been reborn as a work which has encouraged debate on strategy and statecraft.